Assalamualaikum and good morning. Um, before we start our uh, sharing session, can all of you fill in the information in the Google form that uh, Dr. Nick uh, shared in the chat session? Uh, thank you for your cooperation. Assalamualaikum and good morning everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, Analytical Techniques for Nanomaterial Characterization. My name is Lin Eng. I will be responsible for hosting this webinar today. And I'm glad to welcome Associate Professor Technologist Chemist Dr. Nick Ahmad Nizam Malik and Dr. John Madmin from University Technology Malaysia for today's presentation. Before we get started, I would like to go over a few items that require audience cooperation. Please turn off your microphone when the panel is presenting for the smooth running of today's ceremony. We will have Q&A session after both of the panel finish their sharing session. However, you may send in your question at the chat box anytime during the presentation. We will collect these and address them during the Q&A session. Thank you. First of all, let me briefly introduce our first panel. Associate Professor Technologist Chemist Dr. Nick Ahmad Nizam Malik, Director of Center for Sustainable Nanomaterials, Ibn Sina Institute for Scientific and Industrial Research from University Technology Malaysia. His expertise lies in applied material sciences and interested in antibacterial agents, bio nanotechnology, and adsorption related research. Now, without further ado, I will turn the time over to Dr. Nick. Okay. Uh, okay, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and uh, salam sejahtera everyone. Uh, thank you, Silin uh, Eng. Okay, um, PhD student eh? Ah, huh? uh, yeah, yes. PhD student lah, uh, under Postgrad Student Society UTHM lah? Uh? Ah, uh, yes. Uh, okay, right. Thanks for the um, introduction on me. Okay, um, and also thanks to UT, uh, UTHM for giving me the opportunity to uh, give a talk on this uh, title, okay, Article Techniques for Nanomaterial Characterization. Okay, um, so hopefully that um, all of the, we have um, around 47 participants today. And actually, I would like to know the background and also uh, what is your level now? Because I can see that uh, from the Google form, okay, uh, 52% is a PhD student uh, and there are also master student, <clears throat> uh, UG student, lecturer, okay. Um, and then the field also, I can see that is a 
more on engineering so is a uh, more on engineering chemical engineering hydrogen energy and so on okay so that's actually important because uh, I want to know the audience so that uh, this talk will be um, suit to your uh, field. So now I, I know that uh, this is the, it's like a multidisciplinary uh, research, okay, multidisciplinary field. So I will try to, I, I, I will try to give a talk, uh, a simple talk so that we can all understand and we can all aware. Because it's just only one hour, and talking about the numerous characterization me is very big issue. Okay, <laughs> but 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 it's okay. Um, I hope that okay at the end of this uh, talk and uh, under me and also the third one, so you know uh, how you can characterize your materials. Okay, it's not just only focusing on nano material. Maybe what I want to. Okay, I want to highlight here is the uh, techniques, okay, some of the techniques. And also, uh, I think the, 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 the important also is on the application of these materials, okay, on the application. Because I, I, will, I, will, I will show you after this, okay, I will, I will show you my background after this. So for, for today's talk, um, I will give a talk first, okay. And then after that is Dr. Juan Makmin. Uh, so Dr. Juan Makmin is my colleague uh, at the uh, same faculty, uh, but he's actually under Department of Chemistry. Uh, and actually he teaches subject uh, nanomaterial chemistry. So he's actually uh, really expert in characterization, characterization of the material, okay, the fundamental of the characterization technique. But for me, it's just on the um, application. Okay, more on the application of the materials. Okay, thanks for you uh, for the audience uh, responding this uh, responding this uh, form. Uh, Twenty eight respond uh, now. So maybe half of you you can go to the chat. Okay, you can go to the chat. You can go to the link and then fill it in this form. Okay. Um, So this is the title, okay, analytical techniques for nanomaterials characterization. So I will give um, talk on the uh, nanomaterial, okay, uh, character characterization of the nanomaterial, and also some of it come from my current research or from my previous research. Okay, little bit information about me, okay. As the chairperson told about uh, my research area, okay. Uh, actually, my background is chemistry. Okay, I got my first degree, uh, my master, and also PhD. All of them in the department of chemistry, faculty of science. Uh, so it's a straight journey actually. Okay, from degree, master, PhD, straight in the master and also PhD with the same supervisor. And then after that. I got this uh, position as a lecturer at the Department of uh, Bioscience. But before Department of Bioscience, there is actually, uh, this Department of Bioscience uh, is actually a uh, new faculty at that time, 2008, and Faculty of Biosciences and Bioengineering. And then we merged uh, with uh, Faculty of Medical Engineering, and then we, become, we became Faculty of Biosciences and medical engineering and during that time i was the head of department department of uh, biotechnology and medical engineering so i have a background of chemistry working at the uh, department of biotech and medical engineering and now uh, this faculty so we split into bioscience and medical engineering medical engineering goes to faculty of uh, school uh, faculty of engineering okay it's big uh, it, it's be, uh, it became uh, School of Biomedical Engineering under Faculty of Engineering and Department of Biosciences is under Faculty of Science. Okay, and then I'm also the uh, fellow researcher and also director of the Center for Sustainable Nanomaterial. So this is actually my strength or this uh, benefit to me. Okay, uh, benefit for me to develop 
some of the important materials for biology and medical areas. So some example of the application is on the antimicrobial agent or antibacterial agent or antibiofouling agent. Uh, second is biosynthesis of matter nanoparticle, especially the silver nanoparticle. And also I am also involved in the uh, uh, development of adsorbent, adsorbent uh, for the adsorption of the, uh, especially for water treatment. And also I'm also involved in the biomaterials. So biomaterials, ni, those working in the medical engineering knows that biomaterials is the one that we use uh, for bone implant. Okay. Okay. That, that one is for the example lah, for bone implant, for tissue regeneration. So those are the biomaterials. Or the other term, sometimes we use it as a biocompatible material. Where the materials compatible to the logical or compatible to human. And then uh, I'm also involved in the development of hybrid organic and organic materials because we found out that uh, when we combine this uh, organic and inorganic materials together, so it will give a um, higher capacity in terms of absorption, antibacterial agent, antibacterial activity, and biocontability, and so on. An example of the hybrid organic and organic material is a surfactor modified silver zeolite. So silver zeolite, zeolite is one of the uh, mineral uh, that we can actually synthesize it in the lab. Uh, and then we combine it with a surfactant. Surfactant is organic. So we found out that this hybrid material uh, just need a very small amount of the uh, modifier. So modifier to surfactant and also silver, but it will give a higher antimicrobial agent, um, uh, antimicrobial activity or absorption capacity. So those are the um, my research area. Okay. So there are many things that uh, we are doing now and then we, are, we want to do in the future. So in the Department of Biosciences, we have a lab, we have uh, facilities to synthesize the material. And then after that, we straight away analyze this material for the biological application, such, such as antibacterial assay. We can do antibacterial assay here, antifungal, antifungal assay, antioxidant assay, and also the cytotoxicity assay. Uh, so the toxicity involves cell culture. Okay, so the, 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 this is actually my strength. Okay. These are some of my papers. Okay. Uh, these are the recent papers. Actually, I have uh, uh, the, this one is a more on index paper. Okay, index paper. Okay, so the contents of my talk is uh, today, okay, uh, because it's just only one hour. Um, so I will try to compact it and then I will try to finish uh, on time so that I can give uh, um, I can give this talk also to Dr. Juan because Dr. Juan will go into deep on the characterization. Okay, uh, characterization, fundamental of the characterization. Okay, first is what is nanomaterial, second, uh, characteristic of the nanomaterials. Uh, thirdly, typical analytical techniques for nanomaterial characterization, example, and then I will give example from my research, and then after that, summary. So maybe if we uh, have time, there will be online quiz that uh, also I will put it in the chat. Okay, after this. <clears throat> okay, nanomaterials. So uh, when we talk about nanomaterials, uh, we are talking about the smaller, small, uh, because it's deal with nanometer. Uh, nanometer, we know that is a 10 to the power of negative nine. Uh, if you can see this uh, image, okay, there is a scale, scale here, starting from uh, here is actually one nanometer, okay, one nanometer, up to ten to the power of eight nanometer. Uh, any tennis ball, okay. <coughs> Cell is micrometer. <coughs> okay, virus also is, uh, is 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 uh, the size is more than uh, nanometer. Okay, actually COVID nineteen the virus the size is is not nanometer, is micrometer, okay. And then the nanometer is between one to uh, one to hundred nanometer. 
So that is actually considered as nanometer. Below 100 nanometer and then more than 1 nanometer. So if the particle size, the size of the particle is 20 to 50 nanometer. So we can say that it is a nanoparticle. But sometimes this nanoparticle, they tend to agglomerate or they tend to aggregate. Once it's aggregate, it will become a bigger size. So is it, uh, what do you think? Is it nanoparticle? Is it nanomaterial? Well, actually, it depends. Okay, if the particle still remain the same, but it's just only agglomerate, so we can say that the particle is still nano size. Okay, uh, it's still in the nano nano size. Okay, but if the agglomeration or aggregation though becoming a bigger particle, okay, a micron particle. So uh, it is no longer nanoparticle. However, there are some terms that we use, nanocomposite. Okay, some of the nanoparticle immobilize or immobilize onto the uh, micron particle. Okay, so we call it nanocomposite. Sometimes we call it nanofiber. The size of the fiber is uh, in nano size. Uh, sometimes we call it a carbon nanotube. The tube, okay, the size of the tube is nano size. And these are the examples. Uh, my cell, liposome, then we go in the shell, quantum dope, polymers. And this material also, nanomaterial also, it has an organic and also inorganic or hybrid. Okay, organic nanoparticle, inorganic nanoparticle. And inorganic nanoparticle, for example, like gold nanoshell. Okay, hybrid, like for example, dendrima. Sometimes dendrima ni, they put silver inside there, but the dendrima, the framework of the dendrima to itself is the, uh, what do you call this, uh, organic compound. Okay, so when we talk about nanomaterial, okay, so what are the different with the micro size particle? Okay, okay, yeah. So here is a micro size particle, and here, <clears throat> once it becomes smaller, okay, so this is the nano size particle. So what are the changes happen here? So of course that this uh, the, the size is smaller, okay, as compared to micro size particle or the biggest the the, the bigger particle. Uh, and then because of the smaller size here, okay, it will give a higher surface area. And higher surface area, once this uh, material uh, have a high surface area, it will be more reactive. Okay, because there is a more area or more active sites that can uh, absorb, okay, that can react with others, with other molecules or other compounds. And because of that, it has a high absorption area and also higher efficiency. Okay, so these are the nano size particles as compared to the macro size particles. Okay, so, um, so this is actually the fundamental that you need to understand. Okay, so that's why there are actually different characterization techniques that, uh, that we need to do to make sure that uh, we got the nanoparticle or we know the characteristic of the nanoparticle. Okay, so what is important when we, what is the important things that uh, need to know or need to be done <clears throat> for the nanomaterial? Okay, um, okay, if you are involved in the material, okay, in the, in the material, if you are involved in the synthesis of the material or you use the material, so the thing that you know and that you need to know is that you need to know what kind of that material, okay? Because each of material, they have different characteristic. So what is the characteristic, character, characteristic? is the behavior, okay, ciri-ciri. Characterization, um, characterization is pencirian. 
characterization of materials pencirian bahan okey karakteristik is a ciri-ciri sifat-sifat sesuatu bahan so those are the characteristic that you need to know so these are the typical uh, characteristic that uh, you need to know okey i'm saying typical because some of the material they have other important characteristic okay it depend on each type of the materials okay maybe there are some of the material uh, it's not focusing on the structure just focus on morphology only okay maybe some of them the really, really important is physical chemical properties not the structure so it depend on the material so i'm saying here okay i want to give you here the typical characteristic that uh, for, for my for my research okay for for my for our materials that we develop in in the lab okay structure morphology element analysis and also physical chemical properties okay so you need to know your material and know the characteristic of the nano material okay okay these are our static materials and materials uh zeolite zeolite is aluminum silicate silicate halogen and particle then dreamer is the uh, is the organic uh, polymer okay carbon nanotubes okay silver nanoparticle uh, we synthesize it from the particle uh, resources nano composite and also nano fiber okay so my talk after this uh, actually um, i take it from my previous uh, previous uh, research student okay uh thanks to my postgraduate student and also my undergraduate uh, student uh who did on this uh study on this uh, nanomaterial okay and maybe some of them are not nanomaterial just only materials okay but the the technique is almost uh, similar okay uh just only in term of the uh, certain characterization is different okay between nanomaterial and also materials Okay, so characterization. Okay, these are typical uh, instrument that uh, we use for the characterization of the material. Okay, structure. Uh, we we usually use SRD, uh, SRD diffraction, infrared spectroscopy, IR. Morphology. We are using scanning electron microscope or CM uh, or transmission electron microscope, TM or VSEM. Uh, field emission scanning electron microscope. For the element analysis, EDAD or energy dispersive X-ray, or we just call it EDAD. Sometimes EDAD ini is a combined with a TEM or VSEM, and decomposition where we decompose the sample, and then after that we are using a different instrument such as atomic absorption spectroscopy or ICPMS, inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometry or ICPOES. Okay, so uh, there is also addition additional uh, characteristic of the materials. Which are depend on the materials itself and also the application. Okay, like uh, for example, when we uh, in our uh, research, we are uh, using zeolite. Zeolite is aluminum silicate, it, and it is in the uh, uh, crystal, yeah, crystal structure, and it has a ion exchange capacity. So the important physical chemical properties for the zeolite is the surface area and also porosity. Okay, ion action capacity, uh, zeta potential, particle size analyzer, and mechanical testing. So those are the example of the physical chemical properties. There are actually, if you are dealing with the application um, such as uh, for magnetic, so you need to add here magnetic property. Okay, uh, you can add also uh, related to the application as a uh, what um like antibacterial okay so um, is there any uh, uh sometimes we, we we put it as a release release test or leaching test for the physical chemical properties okay so for the physical chemical properties is depend on the materials and also the application of the materials okay srd uh, a little bit information about the srd so we call it as ray diffraction uh the srd will produce x-ray diffractogram or srd pattern 
So these are the typical, not typical actually, um, term, okay, term that we use in your thesis, ke, okay, in your proposal, in your paper, okay. We use the term as a pattern for the uh, result that we obtain from the SRD machine. Okay, X-ray diffraction um, is SRD. Okay, uh, SRD instrument, SRD technique, we call it SRD technique. X-ray diffractogram, not the X-ray pattern. Okay, if you want to say X-ray diffractogram, we say X-ray diffractograms. Okay. Uh, so, I will show you after this what is a SRD photogram. And this SRD is a finger, fingerprint for every crystalline material. It's like a chap jari. Okay. Each of the crystalline material, they have their own peak in the SRD pattern or in the SRD photogram. So, you can just use only one term. If you want to say SRD photogram shows that. And then after that, the subsequent sentence is S-ray diffractogram shows that. If you want to use pattern, use pattern. Okay. And this structural characterization, this SRD, can be used to, uh, to know the uh, structure of synthesis product. And from here, we know the purities or impurities. The crystallinity. Okay, the materials need, it can be in the crystalline form. Crystal, huh? Another one, the opposite of the crystal, crystal is amorphous. Okay. And then post-synthesis modification. Post-synthesis meaning that after we synthesize it, we modify it. Okay. So that's post-synthesis. Uh, modify after the after we synthesis and want to see what happened to the structure. And comparison with raw or pristine to uh, its original sample. Lah. And once we do this modification, so what happened to the structure of the materials as compared to the raw sample or original sample? And effect on the material structure, if we uh, put it in some solution, for example, okay, if we put it in simulated body fluid, in simulated gastric fluid for the bioactivity, okay, and many more, okay. But the most important is that this SRD can be used to know the structure of every crystalline materials. And also, it's not just only crystalline, and also amorphous. Also, it will give information, but not too much. Okay. Okay, uh, I will show you. So, so here, uh, if you can see here, I got this um, spectrum, okay, the fractogram, and also the micrograph of the uh, materials that we have studied uh, and have been published in 2010. So uh, 10 years ago, but still relevant nowadays. Okay, and it's, it was published in Journal of Boros Material. Okay, what is important here is that, okay, although the sample is not in the material, but I want to show you what is the uh, results that we obtain from the SRD. Okay. If you can see here, so this is X-ray diffractogram or S SRD pattern. Okay, remember, uh, if you see here, figure 8, X-ray diffraction pattern, SRD pattern, or we call it X-ray diffractogram. It's not SRD diffractogram. No, okay, the X-ray diffractogram. So these are the important terms that you need to use. For the diffractogram of RHA, Okay, it is, uh, we can say that it is featureless pattern because it will give noise. Why? Because this sample is actually rice has ash contain 90% of amorphous silica. So here is the picture of the amorphous. As compared to the crystal, zeolite is in the form of crystal. So in the form of crystal, uh, you see, crystal, uh, okay, with the, uh, what do uh, specific shape and also specific size, but not for the amorphous. So for the amorphous, it will show X-ray uh, featureless pattern of uh, SRD. Okay, SRD pattern. But for the zeolite, there is a significant peak here. Okay, there is significant peak. Uh, for example, this one. This one shows the 
this one we synthesize zeolite in the lab using SSH as a silica source and we got highly pure zeolite and AY. Uh, so this is one type of zeolite lah. Highly pure, this one. But this one, they are, I want, okay, we want to synthesize zeolite. Why? But then we got other pits than the uh, pit for the zeolite Y. And we found out that the pit is for the zeolite A. Uh, zeolite means there, there is a different zeolite. There is synthetic zeolite. There is a uh, synthetic and also natural. So synthetic, we can synthesize it in the lab. Uh, for the zeolite, the, the name of the zeolite is the zeolite A, X, Y. It's not zeolite A, B, C, D, no. Okay, it's an A, X, Y, P, beta, omega, so many, so many types of zeolite. Lah. So one type is zeolite A. Uh, so this is the pattern. There's a pit for the zeolite A. A, zeolite A, zeolite A, zeolite A. And this for the zeolite Y. And there is also another this one. There's an impurities uh, in the synthesis, in synthesized uh, material, zeolite P. Okay. Okay, um, so the sample, the sample that we submit for the SRD ni is actually in the form of powder. Okay, because at the end, uh, we will produce powder. However, it depends on the sample, the type of sample. Sometimes the type of sample too is bulk. Okay, uh, bulk, screw, uh, for example, screw. So you can also determine the structure, uh, the uh, SRD pattern or SRD diffractogram from the screw. Maybe you coat the screw. I mean, you use this in medical engineering. Okay, maybe you use, you um, coat coating. Okay, put it some layer on top of the catheter. Catheter to it's like a, a knife uh, for the operation. To bedah. Okay, so that one is bulky, but this one is in the powder form. Okay, so these are the information that you get from SRD. Okay, from let's say you can get impurities, you can get the uh, the, the type of the zeolite, the material that you obtain. Okay, and then we need to match this pit with the uh, SRD pattern from PDF, powder diffraction file, PDF. So there are thousands of the uh, Specific picks for the specific SID pattern for each of the materials. Okay, there is a library inside the SRD machine. Okay, <clears throat> so this is one of the, and this is um, uh, examples on how you can present your uh, SRD diffractogram or SRD. And these are uh, application of this SRD. Okay, another one is silver nanoparticle. Okay, so this is the SRD patterns of uh, silver nanoparticle uh, that we synthesize from uh, fusarium or cisporum from the one type of uh, clay, the uh, one type of clay, one type of um, fungus. Okay, mycosynthesis is a fungus lah, myco. Uh, and then there is a specific, a specific, a specific peak for the silver nanoparticles which is at 111, 200, 220, and also 311. And the particle size based on this formula is 42 nanometer. So there are actually other application of the SRD. It's not just only looking at the uh, SRD photogram and then you match with PDF, you got the structure. Actually, in physics, okay, um, in physics, and if you understand the fundamental of the X-ray diff diffraction itself, there are many applications that we can do. Uh, for example, like here, we can determine the particle size. We can determine the, um, what they call this, the, uh, some of the physical chemical properties, uh, some of the physical properties from the SID. Okay, we can determine the impurities inside the sample. Okay, we go to the next um, uh, characterization tools or a character, a characterization what's it called? techniques uh, characterization technique which is infrared spectroscopy okay first you need to understand is that all of the material okay all of the mass they have interaction with the electromagnetic uh, energy okay 
such as microwave, infrared, visible, UV, X-ray, and also gamma rays. Okay, for the gamma rays, for example, okay, so uh, the materials will be ionized because this is the molecular effects of the um, material. They happen um, after interact with the uh, electromagnetic uh, energy, okay, gamma rays. For the infrared, okay, once we give the infrared lights of photon to the sample, so there are actually uh, vibration, the, 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 the bonding of the molecule will vibrate and this vibration will give energy and from that energy, okay, uh, it will produce a spectrum and from that spectrum, we can analyze it and we can determine the functional group or the bonding inside the materials. Okay, so this is the schematic diagram of IR instrumentation. Okay, we have IR source. Okay, there is a reference and so sample. And then uh, there is a, a splitter and also detector. And there is a software. Okay, we use the computer. Uh, from, from here, uh, the computer will change it to the infrared spectrum. Okay. So we are using now the term spectrum for one spectrum, okay, singular spectrum. And if there are two spectrum, so we call it spectra. Okay, spectra is the uh, plural for the spectrum. Okay, not spectrums, huh? it's a spectra. And then uh, here, the y-axis is either percent transmittance, so it is uh, percent transmittance or absorbance. If the y axis to absorbance, so it will be uh, different. It, it, it will give a, um, what do you call this? The opposite of this percent transmitted. Okay. Um, and this is the example of the IR uh, spectra. Okay. Because there is a one, two spectrum here. Okay. For the, um, I think this one is for the zeolite also. Okay. Because there are uh, some pits here. Okay, actually, to learn about infrared spectroscopy ini uh, is one is actually under organic chemistry subject. Okay, uh, uh, but actually, you can you can actually learn by yourself if you are not in the if you do not have a fundamental of this. Okay, you need to understand first. You need to understand the uh, fundamental the, the 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 structure first. Okay, and then what is the interaction between the structure and also the IR uh, lines, okay? So you need to understand the fundamental. If you have the fundamental, that's good. So, but maybe the fundamental that you obtain is come from the organic chemistry. Okay, that's different. Organic chem chemistry, organic compound is contain carbon and also hydrogen. And the opposite of organic is inorganic, uh, inorganic material. Most of the uh, nanomaterial that we have studied is the inorganic uh, material. Okay, so for the inorganic material, we need to understand that inside the sample there is a structure. So what is the build of the structure? For example, like zeolite. Zeolite is built uh, by the SIOAL framework. So the bonding inside the zeolite, which is SIOAL will vibrate after interact with the IR spectrum, uh, IR uh, energy, okay? How about silver nanoparticle? Silver nanoparticle does not, will not give any uh, uh, peak in the IR spectrum because it's just only AG, 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 AG. However, if we synthesize it using biological resources, okay, for example, like plant extract, so inside the plant extract, there are uh, some organic compound and this organic compound will uh, the, the, the bonding inside the organic compound will vibrate once it's vibrate it will give energy and after that it will produce IR spectrum and also IR spectra okay so what are the information from IR spectrum okay we can get information about the functional group 
for example here at around 3,400 uh, here represent OH OH bonding okay and also we uh, will know the bonding okay, the bonding SIOSI for example this one 978 is for the vibration of SIO AL for the zeolite okay and it support result from other characterization technique for example SRD so in the SRD okay there is a zeolite so we know that inside the zeolite there is a SIOAL so this bonding will uh, vibrate okay after interact with IR so it support uh, other character characterization technique okay um, and then uh, below 1000 to okay 1000 to uh, 200 okay it's a fingerprint region so if the sample is really pure and uh, the purity of the sample is like a 98 percent and above so you can actually determine uh, identify the compound okay identify the materials from the uh, from the reference okay it will give a specific peak below 1000 okay so this is actually the picture interaction with light vibration or bonding so this is example of the uh, not, uh, this is the structure uh, of h2o water okay O. this one is h you know, so h so once we give the ir light so it will vibrate symmetrically, sym symmetrically or asymmetrically. So this stretching vibration will give information here. Okay, at this. If there are no OH, so there will be no peak here. Okay. If there is no CH, there will be no peak here. So that's why for this uh, zeolite, there is no CH. Uh, peak for the CH will appear at around 3000. Okay. So if you are in the engineering field, okay, you want to characterize the material uh, using IR spectrum, okay, because you have this um, what you call this, uh, as, uh, you have this kind of instrument in your facility, okay, but you do not have the fundamental. It's better for you to learn a little bit the fundamental of IR before you just. Take it the result, you take it the spectrum, you put it in thesis, you put it in uh, what do you call this? Uh, you put it in paper, okay, conference paper, okay, we give presentation. Uh, because maybe you will give a wrong information. Okay, maybe you interpret with wrong information from this IR. Okay. Okay, infrared but So this is actually, uh, if you see here, this is one of my uh, results from my paper. Okay, uh, where this uh, X-ray SRD has SRD pattern, and this is the uh, infrared spectrum. So they are actually support each other, and then for the IR spectrum, actually we uh, IR spectroscopy. Uh, so the result from here we can put it in the form of table. Okay, we call it as IRP assignment. So we assign those peak with the bonding and you can put it reference showing that this money at all uh, 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 come up with the okay, shows that OH is at 3300 okay this is another example okay this is another example of uh, how we, uh, we can use IR spectroscopy okay in order to determine the uh, uh, what do you call it correlation between the amount of organic molecules adsorbed onto the materials. So we can come up with a different amount of uh, organic molecules adsorbed onto the or attached onto the surface, like this one. And then we can relate to the, uh, we, can, we can see the intensity of the peak, certain peak. So here we determine the CH the intensity of the peak that represents CH stretching. Okay. And we plot it, we found out that there is a correlation between the low amount and also high amount because there is actually, if the graph is uh, reduced, okay, the, the graph is lower, 
So which means that at certain point, there is no place, uh, there is no absorption of the uh, other compounds on the surface. Okay. And also for the infrared spectroscopy, so this is actually uh, what I told you before. Okay, for the silver nanoparticle, there is no peak for the IR spectrum. Okay, inside in the IR spectrum. But if we synthesize it using the uh, organic compound, okay, using the plant extract. So inside the plant extract, there are many phytochemical compounds. So this phytochemical compounds is contains uh, bonding like CH, OH, CO, C, CO, and CO, O. So this actually will appear in the IR spectrum. So those are the bonding, uh, CH, OH, and this OH, C double bond O, we call it as a functional functional group okay, in organic compound. Okay, I want to go to the uh, FISEM. Okay, uh, so this is actually the most widely used uh, characterization technique. Lah, okay, because from FISEM, from ICM, from DM, we can see the picture. Uh, we take a picture of the material. Uh, so this is most, most of the um, universities and most of the agency they have FISEM, ICM. Okay, uh, to take a picture, small picture. Because it's quite interesting, right? Take a picture and then you put it in the TCA. So okay, we can see the we can see the what they call this the picture of this material. Well, actually that's correct. However, there are more information that you can obtain from this uh, PSM. And there are certain, uh, there actually uh, the the term morphology is broad. Okay, if you can see here from PSM, we can determine the morphology. We can analyze the morphology. So what is morphology? Okay, so these are synonym of the morphology and architecture, arrangement, complex construction, design, format, formation, framework, network, organization, system. So those are the important uh, morphology, so synonym of morphology. Morphology does not mean image or picture. No, morphology is talking about the arrangement. Arrangement of what? The arrangement of the particle, whether the particle is agglomerate, okay, or not agglomerate, or it, it, it the, the shape of the, uh, what do you call this, the, the shape, okay, the shape is uh, spherical, okay. So those are the morphology, the formation of the material, the framework, okay, of the materials that we can obtain from the uh, micrograph. Okay, so it's not just only you put it picture and then you explain about the what you see from there. Okay, so actually there are many things that we can determine from the morphology. That's why, that's why I really hope that this is also happened to me, <laughs> happened to my student also, and also happened to the student that uh, happened to the thesis that I evaluate. Okay, some of the student tend to put a lot of picture from the FISEM and then the discussion is just only one paragraph only. It's not enough explanation, but the picture is uh, quite extensive. Okay. So you need to remember, okay, most of the most of the place we pay for this uh, characterization techniques. Okay, we pay like here and uh, FISEM is around 300 ringgit. For one sample only, imagine that and you have five samples, 1,500 ringgit. But your explanation just only one paragraph only. So what do you think? Is it fair? Is it enough? No. Okay. So hopefully that each one of you, okay, once you put it in the, okay, you put it this picture, this image, or we call it micrograph, lah, okay, micrograph in the thesis, in the paper, Place to very comprehensive discuss discussion on that uh, particular what they call this uh, uh, what they call morphology. Okay, so because the term morphology is not just the image or picture, it's actually arrangement, it's a framework and magnetic construction. Okay, and Fisemni is actually important for the nanoparticle. Okay, because we want to know the particle size and 
typical microscope we cannot use it okay because the particle is very uh, small uh, the, 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 the nano nano the particle is in nanometer very small so that's why we need to have a scanning electron microscope okay why i put dash scanning electron microscope and also fit uh, emission scanning electron microscope okay sometimes in some of the instrument they have good SEM so they can take a picture of the uh, nanoparticle lah. okay but some of them uh, will give a blur picture uh, picture to blur when you use SEM so please use VSEM so VSEM is much more the magnification is very high the resolution is uh, higher as compared to SEM okay so if you take a picture from the SEM and then it looks blur and then we cannot get anything from there use VSEM okay but for my student I ask to use VSEM not SEM if you want to determine the nanoparticle but if you want to if you want to take a picture of bacteria just using SEM only okay because uh, bacteria is in micron size okay so you need to select whether you want to use SEM or VSEM and then what is the purpose okay if you want to see the nanofiber use VSEM okay uh, Okay, and another one is TM. Uh, TM also is is very um is important. It's very essential for the characterization of nano materials, nano particles. Uh, here you can see the picture here. This is for the VSEM. Okay, from the VSEM also you need to determine the structure. Uh, here you can see the shape and also the the particle size and TM. TM. It's a cross. Uh, it's like we cut the material, and we can see the particle size very clearly. Okay, so this is instrument of the TM that we got. Uh, we, we actually we have there in UPMU, uh, University Industry uh, Research Laboratory. Okay, here in UTM. So we have also uh, this one is a TM. Okay, this is a PSM. Okay, so TEM is considered to be the most popular technique uh, in electron uh, microscopy. Okay, both TEM and SEM show the size, degree of aggregation, dispersion, and heterogeneity of non material and also for the material. Now, when compared to SEM, TEM has more advantage, advantage in providing spatial resolution in good quality and analytical measurement. So, for nanoparticle, you need to have a micrograph from the TM. Okay. But if you are just using micro micron size uh, material, VSEM is enough. Okay. For TM also, if you um, modify or you put it uh, for, for us, like uh, we put it silver no particle inside the zeolite. So we need to see uh where this uh silver nanoparticle inside the zoolite so we need to use tm okay this is example okay of the uh, paper that we obtain here okay uh, so when we synthesize silicon hydrogen nanoparticle so these are the most important techniques lah. okay uh VSEM and also tm so here is VSEM and also tm Okay, VSEM and also TM. And this is not TM. Okay, this is uh, the picture of the cell. This is a simple microscope only. Okay, but it's important to have a VSEM if you want to determine the silica, if you want to uh, characterize a, a nanoparticle. Okay. These are example of the uh, application of a VSEM. Okay. Uh, this one, we use silica aerogel uh, as a biomaterial. Okay, we want to apply this like aerogel uh, for the bone implant. So one important thing is to, to see the bioactivity of the material. So bioactivity can be done by uh, putting by Im uh, emission, emission by Im immerse, okay, immersing this material in the simulated body fluid. And then after that, we monitor the formation of the appetite on the surface. So one thing that we can do is that we can determine the effect of the uh, 
materials of the CBF. Okay. And this one also, um, okay, I'm sorry. Uh, this is actually the micrograph of sample uh, silica aerogel with different amount of hydroxy appetite. So hydroxy appetite is one material. And then we put it inside the, we incorporate inside the silica aerogel using sol gel technique. Okay. So it will agglomerate and then it will um, uh, encapsulate, not encapsulate. Lah. Okay. We're using the term incorporate. Yeah, so we type inside there, uh, inside the silica aerogel, and then we use VSEN to know the uh, to know the formation of the uh, hydroxy appetite incorporated inside the silica aerogel. Okay. If you want to know more about um, my previous paper, okay, so you can go to the Sol Journal of Soldier Science and Technology. You can find my name and it will appear this one. Okay. We have published here 2020 and also uh, 2019. Okay. There is actually, like I said uh, about the SEM, okay, SEM and also FISEM. Uh, this is uh, one of the problem with SEM. Okay. My student take this uh, image, okay, from the SEM. So uh, you see the image here, the micrograph here is blur. Okay, uh, just same like this one. Uh, this also using SEM. Okay, so this is for the seven particle. So we cannot get much information here. Okay, this one you can get, but for the high quality, if you want to submit to the high impact journal, it will end not accept like this. But for the thesis only, for your own characteriz characterization uh, techniques, it's okay. But that's why you need to have a VSEM and also PM so that you can have a clearer picture. Clearer picture like this one. So this is the TM for the biosynthesis agent B. Okay, you can see the uh, spherical uh, particle. Okay, with the silver particle. Uh, and also we can we can see the size of the particle. So this is the M image of the biosynthesized silver nanoparticle that we have done in the lab. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So uh, this is what we have learned today. Okay. We have the characterization of nanomaterial. Uh, two things. Okay. Two important character, character characterization technique, which is to determine the to analyze the structure. Okay, and then to study the morphology of the material. So for the structure, we can use SRD. It will give a S3 diffractogram or SRD patterns. Uh, and also FTIR. FTIR to Fourier transform infrared. Sometimes we use FTIR or sometimes we use IR. Uh, you need to be consistent. It's all the same, FTIR or IR. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, if you use FTIR, just use FTIR, spectra, FTIR spectrum okay and these are the FDR art spectra okay uh, tm image and we call it as a micrograph okay micrograph so this is from the visa micrograph okay so you see the term there okay the term micrograph srd pattern s3 different is very important in your explanation okay the correct term is very uh, you, you cannot say that it, this is srd spectrum Okay, because uh, based on the fundamental, we use the, the different term. And other characterization, EDS, okay, energy dispersive S ray. Um, EDS, uh, actually, uh, usually this EDS combined with the VSEM and also TM. And we can get the elemental um, information about the elements inside the sample. Surface area and porosity, okay, from the surface area. And porosity instrument here. Okay, for example, this one, this is one of the instrument. We can get the specific space area value. Okay, specific pore volume, pore liangan. Okay, the polymeter, and then we can actually see the difference between the raw material. Here is the original, or sometimes we call it pristine sample, and also the other modified sample. Okay, uh, whether it can can see the specific area will be reduced. Okay, after adding with radium. So those are the things. 
okay, that you need to, you can get from superseron capacity. The LCD zeta potential analysis, the charge of the sample, okay, the charge of the material, whether it's positive and also negative. Okay, actually, uh, there are many characterization techniques that you can do. Okay, uh, it's based on your material, based on your application, and also the um, uh, available facility in your uh, lab. Okay. But this characterization techniques is not just uh, we, we can we, we it's not just applied for the synthesis, okay, for to know the material after synthesis, to know the material after the modification. It's not just only there, okay. You can actually design the experiment so that these characterization techniques can be used to analyze the sample after certain application or after certain effects uh, many things lah. i give you an example here okay this is actually about the um, silica aerogel uh, incorporated eh, aerosi appetite sorry okay aerosi appetite incorporated silica aerogel from resus ash so uh, if one we got uh, we we produce different ratio and from this different ratio, we characterize with all of these characterization techniques. Okay, and then we get information about material. After that, we want to use this material as a bone implant. So one of the techniques is that we immerse this uh, material in the simulated body fluid. And after that, we characterize it again. Okay, using almost the same, but we need to select because this is actually related to the uh, formation of the appetite on the uh, material and then uh, again in SPF also you characterize it the solid fraction and so the liquid fraction another thing okay and this is another example okay this is uh, actually from my PhD uh, when we modify it okay this is a factor modified zeolite so we want to modify the materials we also need to characterize it uh, in my uh, PhD, so we use this zeolite as a uh, drug support system. So when we want to prepare, uh, we want to study the effect of this uh, material uh, in human body. So what we can do is that we can put it in simulated gastric fluid. And then we analyze the solid fraction using the uh, almost similar uh, characterization techniques. Same goes to this one. Okay, uh, so design your experiment, not just only use this characterization tools to determine your, uh, to analyze the sample after you synthesis, but also use it for the subsequent analysis. Okay, uh, so as a summary, um, as a summary here, so characterization of materials is nanomaterial. material. The application, nanometer synthesis, modification, and also the composite. Okay, you know, so characteristic of the materials. So you should know the characteristic of the materials. Okay, each of the materials, it has its own characteristic. For example, uh, zeolite, and that we have studied. Okay, zeolite, it has a surface area. It has a pore, uh, pore. It has a cation exchange capacity. So those are the characteristics. It is in the form of crystal rather than amorphous. And also the application of the materials. And if you're using as a halogen storage, storage, for example, so there is a certain requirement for the materials that you need to determine. And these are typical characterization techniques, structure, morphology, analysis, physical chemical properties, and also design your, and, and, and after that, okay, my um, advice to, to you, okay, to all of the researcher, to all of the student, you can actually design your experiment so that you use these characterization techniques not just only to, uh, not just only for the synthesis and also modification of the material, but use it more than that, okay. Okay, before I end this, I want to promote this journal. Okay, this is new journal under Penembik UTM. Uh, journal of Materials in Life Sciences, Life, Life Science. 
Okay, uh, I'm a chief editor of this journal. So the first volume will be on this December, December 2021. So this is actually considered as non-index journal. So please, if you have a paper, a simple paper, not simple paper lah, okay. Paper to materials in life sciences. For example, you, uh, you, you, you synthesis the zinc nanoparticle, for example, or synthesis nanoparticle using plant extract. So this actually can be published here. Okay. You can actually, if, if you are not sure, you can try publish. You can try submit and we will consider whether it can be accepted or not. So this is new journal. Okay, journal of materials in life science. Why I come up with this journal? Okay, I propose this journal because I found out that, okay, if you are doing materials, if you want, and then we have done uh, what we call this uh, research, okay, and then you want to, you, you come up with a paper. So the paper is, uh, you, you target this paper for Q1 and Q2 or high impact journal, right? And you try submit for the, or you try submit this uh, paper to the certain high impact journal. Okay. Uh, but sometimes uh, you got really frustrated because uh, the editor reject your uh, paper. Okay. Why? Because most of the materials, uh, materials related journal, they need, they want to consider materials very deep, very deep, okay, very deeply on the materials too. Okay, if we just only come up with structure, simple, and then, but we have done a lot of things on the application, they will not, uh, what do accept it, uh, um, at the first stage. Uh, sometimes they're rejected by the reviewer, okay, because of the lack of uh, information on the materials. But for this journal, we hope that okay, there is only um, uh, we can consider papers that have forty percent of materials, sixty percent of the application of the materials. But make sure that the application is on the life science lah, okay, in the agriculture, in the food, okay, uh, veterinary, toxicology, and so on. So that's why I come up with this kind of paper, uh, so that we can actually appreciate those. We are doing the materials uh, research, but focus more on the other side of the materials. Okay. So uh, I think uh, that is for the uh, okay. So that is actually for the for my for my talk today. Actually, um, Celine Jefferson. Yes. yes. Okay. Uh, actually, I want to. Okay. Can, 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 can I. Actually, I want to share the quiz here. Is it okay? Uh, yeah, sure. You can share it. Okay. Wait. Uh. Okay, I put this link. Oh no, no, sorry, to everyone. Huh? Okay, I put this link here in the chat room. Okay, in the chat room here. Okay. Uh, so this is um, jam suka suka lah. Okay. Uh, 
Uh, can each one of you, okay. Um, now I think the total of the uh, audience is 69, 70. Uh, and hopefully those uh, uh, who did not fill in the form, please uh, fill in the form. You can go to the chat room and then fill in the Google form. And then you can try to answer this. Okay. Uh, it's a competition actually. Yeah. Because it's um, apa nama tu? there is a leaderboard. Okay. So can you try this, each one of you? Okay. So that will be more understand on this. Um, apa nama tu? What uh, I'm shared. Uh, what is uh, the, 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 the materials, uh, characterization of materials? Okay. It's about characterization of the materials. Uh, very easy, simple je. And to uh, budak sekolah menengah pun boleh boleh jawab. Okay. Uh. Okay, I think that's it. Um, so the audience, you can uh, please fill in the Google form okay, in the chat room, and also uh, the and also the uh, online quiz. Okay, from the word wall. Too. Okay, uh, and then maybe during the during the Q and A session after talk by Dr. Juan, I can share the results from this. Okay. Uh, because I can I can show to you the leaderboard who is the rank first, second, and also third. Okay, and then if want to uh, if if we get this, if you win this, maybe the organizer can give your gift. Okay. okay, so uh, thank you very much, Dr. Nick, for sharing your knowledge with us. And also, please, audience, you can answer the quiz that given by Dr. Nick. The link is given at the chat box. So uh, feel free to answer the quiz. Uh, okay. So, please, please give the real name. Lah. Okay. <laughs> I got here Miza Popo. <laughs> give the real name. Lah, okay. Uh, okay, so uh, without delaying, we will continue this webinar with Dr. John Matmin, Head of Green Chemistry Research Group from Department of Chemistry, Faculty of Science, uh, University Technology Malaysia. He is an expert in nanomaterials from polymer engineering and advanced materials. Dr. John also interested in design of functional molecules based on supramolecular chemistry for crucial application in the optoelectronic devices, color tunable materials, biomaterials, and chemosensors. I will now welcome Dr. Juan to start, to start his session. Assalamualaikum and a very good day. Good morning. Good morning. Okay, I hope you can hear me clearly, everybody. Yeah. Yes, I can hear you clearly, Dr. Joan. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks to the uh, MC, Selim, for a nice introduction. And welcome everybody for the uh, today talks. Okay. I will be sharing a bit on what I know on the characterization of nanomaterials. Uh, sorry that I'm re not really familiar with this zoom app so i need to uh, be familiar a bit on the uh, setup here yeah so
Okay, my name is Dr. Juan Matmin. Okay, I'm the head of Green Chemistry Research Group from the Department of Chemistry. <clears throat> okay, uh, what is actually uh, this Green Chemistry Research Group is actually uh, the group that is established in the Department of Chemistry and they are uh, what we call as uh, a bunch of people that are interested in green initiative. Okay, so that's uh, who we are. And these are the experts in the green chemistry. Okay. Uh, so if you have any question regarding uh, nanometer or polymer engineering, you can always consult me. If you have any uh, inquiry in the forensic science analysis, you can uh, consult our topic. Uh, if you have any uh, inquiry on organometallic, you can always uh, assist us assistant from uh, Dr. Sazwan. And if you have any uh, inquiry in the uh, for or uh, biofuel, you can always refer to Dr. Susi. Uh, Dr. Sila is an, the expert in the photocatalyst. Uh, you have uh, any works in computational chemistry or you want to simulate anything that regarding uh, modeling or uh, uh, what we call as uh, uh, Gaussian uh, software or anything, you can always refer to Dr. Fazira. The city Amina is the expert in surface and collar. So uh, these are the uh, main uh, uh, researchers in this green chemistry group. And as Dr. Nick said, when we talk about nanomaterial, it's the size within 10 to the one negative nine nanometer, meaning that it's very small. Uh, and uh, you can always imagine how small it is uh, when you are uh, referring to your uh, things that in front in your eyes, okay. So such as your and here is uh, already small, but when we talk about nanometrial, it's much more smaller than that. Okay, this is less uh, than a thousand of a strand of hair, and uh, meaning that this material is really so small and it have the uh, tendency of uh, having a, a what we call as a interesting phenomena because. The size and the shape dependent properties here is actually interesting. Okay, so these are the uh, characterization methods. Okay, the characterization methods uh, that is typically used, and uh, part of it have been uh, uh, well introduced by Dr. Nick. Okay, but I will uh, highlight only few. Okay, and how it can contribute to your works later. Okay, and uh, in nanomaterial, when we talk uh, about this material, you know that the size is important. So, uh, the most prominent works in doing this uh, size uh, quantification is usually uh, by dynamic light scattering or DLS. Okay, uh, this uh, instrument measures the speed of uh, particles. Okay, I will be going uh, a bit in depth on the theoretical part because I have been uh, teaching this subject of nanometer for years. So allow me to give you the brief introduction on the theory. Then uh, we can apply it in the uh, what we call as the application side later. Okay. So when we talk about the LS, as mentioned, we measure the particle because uh, nanometer uh, is not going to be uh, uh, still. Okay. The tak duduk diam so nanomaterial try to move uh, especially when we have a, a suspension okay so it's move as a uh, following the brownian motion so that's why uh, we can uh, based on the brownian motion there we can always uh, measure the influence of the particle size uh, the sample viscosity and uh, take note that the temperature is also uh, going to have the influence of the uh, how the nanometer moves. Okay. So in theory, okay, when we talk about Brownian motion, is a random, okay, and when we talk about is a random and the erratic motion, uh, is always going to have uh, the uh, uh, what we call as the uh, relation towards the particle size and the viscosity and the temperature. This is the instrument that. Uh, usually uh, being used uh, by researcher here. Uh, the, pro, uh, the most uh, famous uh, brand is known as Melvin, okay, Melvin Zeta Sizer, uh, particle sizer. And uh, uh, this is also uh, in the 
uh, UIRL that is been introduced by Dr. Nick. Okay, uh, when we talk about the DLS, like, uh, we, we know that uh, the speed of the particle is measured as a diffusing uh, Brownian motion and it's uh, have, uh, have the uh, effect of the intensity of the scattering light. Need that a smaller particle cause the intensity of light to fluctuate more. Okay, when we beam uh, with the light source there, uh, the uh, fluctuation of uh, smaller particles going to have a, a greater correlation. This is because uh, we are going to correlate it based on the diffusion uh, functions. Okay, correlation function. Uh, this is basically how we look at the Brownian motion. Okay. You have a particle that eh? is very small and then it's vibrate and move uh, along each other okay so then this measurement is actually uh, this uh, movement is actually uh, random and when we beam it with the light intensity okay, the intensity there uh, going to have while well, well, either uh, and constructive interference or destructive interference this uh, we when we learn on the physics side and uh, based on the uh, with particle like characteristic of light so we can have a correlation okay this is uh, the correlation function of the large particle a larger particle going to uh, decay much uh, longer okay this is a larger particle uh, that is going to decay much longer your time is is more while the smaller particle going to uh, decay much more quickly okay compared to this one so Based on this correlation, uh, we can measure the mean size, okay, based on the uh, time that is uh, used uh, during the Brownian motion. And based on the gradient here, okay, you have the gradient of the certain decay, decaying time there, uh, is going to indicate the polydispersity of the sample, okay. So not only we can know the size, okay, the mean of the size, but how good is dispersed in the uh, solution. Your particles are eh, going to disperse good in the solution. It's also uh, going to, uh, can be uh, retrieved by this use of the LS. Okay, but when we talk about the size, take note that uh, the size using the, hydro, uh, the LS here is the hydrodynamic, hydrodynamic diameters. Okay, uh, we are going to discuss further on the hydrodynamic diameters. What is it? Okay. Uh, basically, when we talk about the uh, hydrodynamic diameter here, uh, if you have any uh, particle there, it's not only measuring one particle uh, or anything that is uh, uh, smaller than this uh, size, but it's actually we're measuring the, uh, what are those in the surface of the particles. Okay, So uh, let's say you have a core shell. Okay, blended with the uh, polymer. So uh, we are not going to uh, measure the core shell only, but we are going to measure the core shell as well as the uh, polymer attached to it. Okay, so this is hydrodynamic diameters. And uh, take note that this hydrodynamic uh, diameter is uh, usually uh, dependent on, highly dependent on the surface structures and the concentration and the medium of your uh, uh, samples. Okay, so the preparation of the sample in the solution that we are going to measure is really important. Uh, that's why uh, when you send your sample to any analysis in this institute, make sure uh, you know what are the intended uh, size, okay, the range, yet you have already done uh, a few works okay, in, in analyzing the sample, let's say you have done your XRD there, or uh, you have done your uh, TAM, you know, the uh, prosomic science, okay? Then uh, you, you can send it to, to the uh, research center or, or, or else the, research, uh, the result that they are going to give you is uh, not tally and uh, might uh, make you confused with the result later. So this is uh, in terms of hydrodynamic size, uh, in uh, uh, different structures. Take note that hydrodynamic size is always a, a circle, okay? Uh, whether it's a, a polymer coated on the uh, 
particles where there is an agglomerated uh, atoms, okay, uh, or particles. Uh, we always refer the hydrodynamic size as a circle here. Uh, whether the shape is an ellipsoidal or really not uh, as uh, presented by Dalton, you, you have a different type of zeolite there, but we still count it as a circle of the uh, uh, the sphere or sphere of the uh, uh, sample. Okay. So uh, the LS is used to characterize size, and it is very uh, important in determining the size of proteins, uh, micelle, and nanoparticle as well. And uh, as mentioned, uh, based on the degree, the, uh, based on the uh, decay uh, of your correlation function earlier. Uh, you know that the gradient they're going to give you the polydispersity. So meaning uh, that it's going to have the indication of how good the stability of your uh, particles in the uh, solution. So whether uh, how, how long it's going to be stabilized, okay, before it's uh, sediment down, okay, uh, uh, it's going to aggregate. Uh, you can uh, refer that using the uh, DLS. Okay, so how DLS can contribute to your works? Right, so I remember my works in determining the uh, nanosheet of this uh, thin disulfide, okay? So uh, it is quite challenging, uh, okay? Because uh, nanosheets tend to agglomerate to each other, okay? It's not tend to stack in, okay? And uh, we have difficulties in, uh, justifying that is a nano science. So I collaborated, I remember this work, I collaborated with uh, some researchers from German, okay? they want to promote their uh, DLS in, uh, to penetrate the uh, SN market. So uh, I said that, okay, uh, why not? Uh, let's try uh, using your sample. And this is uh, how they manage uh, to got the size of this nano sheets okay so uh, based on their laser refraction uh, of the particle size we know that the size that are go uh, going to give you a distribution uh, function this is uh, almost a binomial distribution around 0 0.31 to 2.9 micron okay but uh, the average size is around 870 nanometers, which uh, this is actually good because uh, is actually in good agreement with the uh, result in TEM. Uh, when we uh, scan our sample and have the TEM micrograph, uh, the sample is actually around uh, greater than 500 nanos. Okay, so that is uh, uh, in line with the DLS measurement. And when we uh, use our FSM image, so we can uh, see that this uh, uh, sample is actually a nano sheet material and uh, it's a highly agglomerated and a sheet like aggregation uh, with the distribution around 800 nanometers, which is uh, in the end is actually a good, uh, in a good agreement with the LS, right? Uh, but when we see our TEM here, you know that although it's a layer, uh, it's actually consists of a uh, rhombedal uh, structures. Okay, based on that, when our, on these findings, okay, uh, based on the DLS and TEM, we come out a plausible mechanism here that uh, the structures is uh, growth as a uh, 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 what we call as aromatic uh, structures first, okay. How Introduce to you, but uh, when we uh, talk about uh, the DLS, the there are certain things that you need to 
consider okay the advantage and disadvantage of this uh, uh, characterization uh, although it's a, a very fast uh, it's that actually does not produce any high resolution of the histogram or the signs okay uh, although you can measure a very small quantity of the sample the state information is not easily obtained that's why you need uh, for the characterization using TEM and SAM. Uh, and take note that uh, some of the sample is not really compatible because there is a, uh, we use light uh, intensity as the uh, detect, uh, detection method, okay, to, to have a correlation with the light. So some of the sample that is not really uh, uh, good uh, with light, such as uh, absorbing a material is, uh, cannot really tolerate with this uh, use okay with the, the instrument there and uh, there are also uh, uh, possibility of uh, dust interpreti uh, 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 interpretation or contamination okay so that's why uh, you have to be very careful uh, you have to know what are your sample that and uh, give the uh, what we call as the uh, 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 size distribution first to your operator letter uh, to know how they can uh, actually optimize uh, the result. This is a, a very uh, uh, fast uh, measurement and but uh, it's somehow tedious. So uh, you have to understand your sample first. Uh, in terms of the limitation here, take note that. Uh, we actually measure the hydrodynamic size radius okay, in a circular form, okay, in a spher spherical uh, shape structures. And somehow uh, it gives you a low resolution okay, because when size are populated uh, due to the closely space, uh, the, the, the DLS is not going to be giving you the uh, polydispersity uh, precisely. So, uh, you have to optimize in terms of that. Okay, uh, that is in terms of DLS. So uh, let's talk about microscopy technique. Okay, uh, micros microscopy technique is not suitable for nanoscale analysis because, uh, as mentioned, uh, visible light around 500 nanometers, uh, but half of it is around 250 nanometers. Uh, is only visible to our eyes. Okay, the smaller than that, uh, those within the nanometer, uh, is not going to be uh, really uh, distinguished. So it's going to be blurred. Uh, that's why uh, we need a more advanced uh, microscope called as the electron microscope, which uh, there are two uh, mainly type of this. Uh, instrument, one is transmission electron uh, microscope, and one is the scanning electron microscope. Okay, just imagine that you have a, a book, okay, you have a book, so don't judge a book by its cover, but when you have a book here, you're only uh, able to scan the surface here using the sand, okay, you, you only have uh, uh, able to scan this, uh, the uh, surface structures how the uh, morphology outside that are going to be look like. So you have a very thin morphologies steps, okay? But when you do your TEM, you're going to know that this books is actually uh, covered uh, or in composed of several uh, sheet, okay? Several uh, papers of uh, their, their writing, okay? That is how you distinguish between the STM and TEM. TEM going to allow you to study the inner structures while on the SEM will give you uh, the brief uh, surface structures of the uh, object analyzed. Okay. So uh, not only that, uh, advanced characterization of the electron microscope going to be able to give you the uh, morphology, the topography, and also the composition of your uh, structures. Okay, this is the setup of our TEM. Uh, uh, okay, so sorry, this is the setup of our SEM scanning electron microscope. Okay, 
we have this in the uh, UIRL and uh, it's used uh, detection of a secondary electron and the back scattering electron as well as the uh, X-ray fluorescent. Take note that uh, the uh, operational uh, use of this uh, instrument usually uh, you have a electron source coming to the sample line and then uh, when it's interact to your uh, sample that there is a certain what we call as uh, uh, electron backscattering and that reflected to the uh, uh, detectors or and this uh, going to give you the image okay you have the backscattered electron you have the secondary electron and uh, there are three mode operation typically uh, that is going to uh, determine whether you are going to have a good resolution of your image or not. Uh, the primary uh, going to give you high resolution, one to five nano, uh, while the secondary usually used in the uh, characterization of your uh, X-rays. Okay, This is uh, going to be discussed later on how we determine the uh, FFT. Uh, the, the tertiary here uh, going to give the clues of what are the elemental composition of the sample. So that is the thing that you can actually obtain by SEM. Okay, you have a, a primary resolution of the uh, around one to five nano. Uh, you can actually do the uh, elemental composition. Uh, you actually can do a, a, a electronic images. Okay, primary, secondary, and tertiary. <clears throat> Okay, how do we get the image from the SEM? Uh, this is in theory, uh, you are playing uh, what we call as the jigsaw puzzle. Okay, uh, you put one piece of uh, the uh, image there, part of it, and then in the end, part by part, you get the uh, overall image afterwards uh, that the image is going to be formed uh, as a a whole uh, picture, okay. Uh, in in the SEM, we denote it as a micrograph, okay. So uh, this is what we call as point-to-point -point detection. Point-to-point -point detection is based on the electron count, okay. So this is uh, where you uh, in the example here you are uh, scanning a specimen of and share, okay. Uh, and take note that. Uh, in every line of this detection, uh, there is a point and line detection. In the end, it's going to be uh, collected together to give you uh, the overall image, right? But uh, SEM require you to be able for the sample uh, use in the uh, vacuum. This is to reduce any uh, interference based on the uh, beam intensity and the stability. Or else, if there is any uh, gas molecule in the system, you will have a lower contrast. And in the end, it's going to be difficult to distinguish what are the image form. To, uh, to overcome this, you need to uh, have a good sample preparation. So SEM, okay, based on my experience, usually uh, student going to have a really tough in the preparation part if you don't really have a good preparation. You are going to have a not only blurred image but highly agglomerated one. Uh, that's why uh, the sample preparation is also important. Okay, make sure your sample is really clean and completely dry, meaning that you before you send the sample, make sure you, you put uh, actually uh, in the in the oven for overnight dry to remove the moisture there, and then in the end, uh, you need to coat it to make them conductive. Make sure you choose uh, the correct uh, coating uh, uh, preparation methods. Okay, These are the available uh, uh, sputtering coater. Okay, So take note that there is uh, usually uh, what we call as the uh, platinum coating. Okay, You have a platinum here to coat the sample to make it more conductive. Uh, there is also much more expensive coating using a gold. And uh, in, uh, your sample must be placed on the stub uh, around 13 millimeter radius aluminum there. 
uh, and uh, the, the placement of the sample also is important. If you really uh, place a good uh, thin layer uh, or very fine uh, sample, you're going to have a good image. But if you really uh, just spray that is going to give a good image, it wouldn't, it wouldn't work. Okay, so uh, the sample preparation is a bit tricky here. And usually those who are really familiar and experienced in, in this preparation uh, going to know how much of the sample uh, required or uh, used to, to determine, uh, to give you a good uh, micrograph image. Okay, how SAMs can contribute to your works? Okay, this is uh, a paper that discuss on uh, different uh, transformation. Okay, uh, okay. Uh, I use uh, starch, right, starch template uh, for, uh, to generate the titanium silica. Uh, without any use of the surfactants, okay? But I would like to monitor the direct continuous preparation here. So, uh, the same image uh, give, you, uh, give me the uh, uh, transformation from the rust starch here, and we gelatinize it. If you have a, a gel, okay? This is prepared. This is a bit tough to prepare. It's actually using uh, what we call as the uh, dried, uh, uh, dry, uh, freeze dry uh, simulation here. Uh, and then uh, we transform the rice starch here uh, as the bundle within the uh, silicate. Okay, so this silicate here uh, going to be transformed into the uh, uh, nano, nano structured silica. Okay, this is you got as. Uh, uh, what we call as the rice starch and the silica sauce here. So this is in bundle, okay, in a, a highly aggregated. Then uh, we want to transform it into the silicate here. Uh, so that's why uh, Sam here can contribute in displaying the morphological transformation uh, towards a process or in the synthesis. So we can come up with the uh, possible mechanism here. Take note that uh, based on different scheme here, we transform our starch into the uh, sol gel uh, rest starch, okay? And then we transform it again into the uh, nanostructured uh, silicate, tetanus silica here. Tetanus silica is come uh, afterward in the scheme four. So based on uh, the uh, SEM, okay, we not only see a single morphology, but we can uh, depict how the transformation of our uh, process, okay? Let's say you have a different scheme scheme in your uh, schematic diagram there, uh, in your proposed uh, procedure. So you actually can monitor that based on the transformation of your uh, morphology, okay? So this is actually important for you uh, to understand that not only the final product is important, okay, the one, but the, the overall process can be closely monitored. Uh, the changes in the morphology is also significant, okay. So uh, the advantage of SEM is actually work very fast, okay. Uh, the modern SEM allow for the generation of the digi digital form, meaning that you can uh, obtain the uh, micrograph uh, in the uh, soft copy, okay. And you only uh, require a minimal preparation action. But, okay, this is also important here. The disadvantage is that SEM is not uh, simply operated by anybody. Okay? Those who are less experienced going to find it difficult to have a high resolution image. Okay? And some uh, of the sample might be contributed by the artifacts or uh, defects that is. Uh, actually doesn't make sense in your uh, overall uh, sample preparation. And this SAM is, is only limited to this solid sample, okay? Uh, right? So when we, you are triggered to, or asked to do your SEM image, uh, don't just simply rely on the operators, 
but please provide them with the image that you are you you are intended to to have. Let's say you are going to do a work in your life uh, and is have the uh, uh, special image or the structures there. Make sure you give the operators operators them on uh, what uh, are the intended uh, morphology that you are going to have. Okay. So this is the second uh, microscopy that we are going to discuss today. This is actually a TEM, okay? It's actually a unique tool and you can uh, uh, get the information of the crystal structures and the uh, microstructures simultaneously, okay? So this is the only instrument that's going to give you the crystal structures and the microstructures simultaneously based on the diffraction and the imaging technique. So this is how the uh, operational principle look like because the, the electron here, the primary electron here uh, act as the wave light characteristic uh, and the electron there going to accelerate it in the vacuum chamber and then uh, it's going to be penetrated into the solids. Right? And based on that, uh, you are going to have a uh, different resolution of image based on the uh, angle that you are going to to look like to to look at the sample okay so uh, these are the important uh, setup of our tm it consists of the electron source the electromagnetic lens systems okay this is very very uh, expensive if you brought this lens here yeah, uh, you can wait for a year to to call for the replacement, okay. So, uh, so make sure when you prepare the sample there, coated on the copper grade there, make sure the sample is uh, not going to have any effect to the electromagnetic lens. Uh, the sample holder is placed here, okay. And this is the imaging system. This imaging system is based on the uh, objective lens as the projectors lens, okay. So this is what I mentioned earlier on the degree of angle, whether you are going to have a bright field imaging or a dark field imaging. You, you, it's based on how you tilt the uh, incident beam. Okay? Uh, if uh, the sample going to really become, uh, if your sample is really dense, so maybe you have to optimize on this. This requires a, a special training also. Okay, it's not going to be easily because you actually have to detect the crystallinity of the material based on the diffraction first. Okay, and then you are going to optimize the intensity based on the orientation planes. Okay, this is the uh, final uh, part where you are actually going to uh, increase the contrast image. Okay, so whether it's uh, going to have a bright field. Uh, off dark field or on exist dark field is always uh, depending on how good is the sample coated on the copper grid. Okay, how time can contribute to your words? Okay, in this uh, paper, okay, I discuss on the uh, uh, again rice touch as an additive free, but I need to prove this sample is actually a, a spherical nano subject hematite. Okay. So when we do our TEM analysis, we found that uh, this uh, structure is consists of the, uh, this is what uh, I touched on the FFT, okay? The FFT here it is uh, significant or correlated with the uh, diffraction pattern of our uh, rhombohedral structures of our hematite. So we can uh, give a good, uh, Fourier field transform image, and you can distinguish that this is uh, actually 110001, uh, which is uh, important uh, based on our structures of hematite. Okay, and uh, not only that, we also determine based on the lattice fringe. Okay, of a, uh, using the uh, Bradley equation, there you know that this is uh, 110 of. Uh, at 0 0.25 nanometer, which is uh, a this uh, spacing for our hematite or iron oxide, F2O3. 
So uh, we call uh, it is in a good agreement with our XRD analysis because uh, we all we have uh, distinguished uh, already uh, what we call as uh, match it with the uh, DCPDF file. Okay, you, we got that uh, the this uh, the uh, significant uh, defractogram uh, is corresponding to our rhombohedral phase and uh, consists of uh, hematite. Okay, so this is in good correlation with the uh, TEM image that we have. Okay, so. What I, I would like to emphasize here, the TEM image is not only uh, important to give you the uh, size structure. Okay, you can uh, further uh, analyze it and uh, to support uh, the in good agreement with your XRD. Okay, as been done here. Okay, so it's actually in good agreement, and we actually can calculate the lattice parameters also. Okay, so. Uh, which is which, okay? Sam uh, versus stem. So which is going to be uh, significant in your works? Okay, take note that uh, these are the comparison between Sam and Tem. Uh, for Sam, uh, you have to know that your sample must be conductive or else uh, you will not get uh, any image and it will burn directly. And for the TM, uh, a good, uh, preparation method needs uh, it must be thin enough here uh, to be able to be coated on the copper grid and, and to give you a good image or else you just see on the clumps okay so take note that the SEM going to uh, able to detect and 300 key magnification but the TEM here uh, going to give you a an image up to 1 million times. Okay. Uh, how both SAM and TEM can contribute to your works? Um, remember that uh, I need to prove the uh, spherical structures of the hematite, then spherical of the nanostructured hematite. So when we analyze the uh, TM, we know that it uh, is a hematite form in the rhombohedral structures. Uh, but when we see on the SEM, it's actually spherical. And to give a strong justification of the spherical structures, we do an analysis called an image J analysis. This is actually a free software developed by researchers in Oxford. Okay, you can download it freely, and based on that, you know that uh, you can do a surface plot and on the selected image there. This is going to give you the indication of a good image. How? is the contour or the uh, what we call as the topography of the image, okay? So based on the plot profile and the uh, surface plot here, this is actually a, a good spherical structures, only that is consists of a rhombohedral hematite. So that is how you uh, put the things together to support each other, the SAM and the TEM image. In the end, we come up with the plausible mechanism that the primary aggregation in the uh, scheme here, in the scheme one here, is contributed by the uh, iron species attached to the starch. And the secondary aggregation going to give uh, 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 small uh, hematite structures within the uh, rice starch, you know, within the polymeric rice starch. And uh, to remove that, it uh, becomes swollen. Okay, and it's get, get giving you the uh, crystallization of the spherical hematite. This is uh, based on the uh, analysis that we have done, like XRD, TM, and the FECM image. Uh, last but not least, the one that uh, I would like to emphasize today is on the AFM. If AFM is a bit tricky because uh, uh, you have to know that uh, not, on, not all sample require AFM, okay? Uh, you require an AFM across, uh, imaging, okay, when you need to determine the topography, okay, meaning that uh, it's not only X, Y, but the Z exists. The Z exists uh, of the sample is important. Usually, 
uh, this is going to be very beneficial if you develop a sample uh, of the polymer electrolyte, things that is combined with the uh, polymer. You need to see the overall uh, structures. Okay. So how this work, the air hem work, it's like you have a, a finger pointing at your, your, your face. Okay. Uh, and uh, this is uh, using the, uh, what we call as the tips, okay, a sharp tips. And uh, there are different modes of the tips that is going to operate to give you uh, the overall topography, okay. So uh, let's say you have a tip here and then you start to uh, travel around your face, okay, such so touching your face uh, and this uh, response is going to be turned into the uh, topography image. Okay, that is how you uh, tend to picture uh, or depict it, uh, how the operational work of the uh, AFM. So the important thing is that uh, you have to know what are the modes uh, on the tips. Whether you have a uh, tips that is going to be. Uh, uh, touching on the surface of your sample or the non-touching modes, okay? This is the operational principle. As I mentioned, it's work based on the sharp tips there. And uh, it's work using the piezoelectric scanners. Uh, you have uh, uh, changes in the tip sample interaction. Uh, so you have a tip here and it's going to move along the, what we call as the raster scan. And in the end, it's going to transfer this interaction to give you a, to generate a, a sample topography, okay? Uh, the tip here is known as the, uh, what we call as uh, cantilever, okay? Uh, the ability for you to distinguish which one is uh, 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 what we call uh, 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 compatible uh, cantilever is important, okay? So this is how we do a raster scan, okay? You have a surface of your sample here and the tip of your uh, cantilever here uh, going to apply certain force where the, uh, on different modes, okay, on the surface of atom. Okay, these are the main component of the AFM, all right? The main component of the AFM here uh, and uh, it's need to have the uh, piezoelectric scanner as well as the detectors as, uh, as the feedback. This is actually uh, uh, all the electronic devices. Okay, so this is how we place our sample. Okay, so AFM tip is important for you to uh, able to know the imaging. If you uh, choose a, a tip that is not compatible to your sample, it's not going to give you a good uh, resolution of the image. And uh, some of the, uh, this is how we, uh, have the, the imaging of our uh, AFM. Okay, your sample is actually placed uh, uh, not on uh, not in real context, but this is uh, going uh, to have a, a wonderful forces in between the sample and the tip. Okay, but when you start to touch directly, it's not going to give you a, a really representative image. Okay, this is a distortion. As type of image, okay. All right, this is the principle of our AFM. It's uh, work uh, accordingly based on the Hooke's law, okay. So as mentioned, there are three type of mode that is available. One is the uh, contact mode. One is the tapping mode. Tapping mode in that you uh, pinch the sample. Contact mode is indirectly contact, not uh, based on the Van der Waals forces. But the non-contact mode is uh, based on the repulsive force, right? Uh, how we going to differentiate between this mode, uh, the close contact, uh, usually uh, going to have a, a repulsion, okay? And it's measure the repulsion between the tip and the sample, and it's need to apply a constant force, uh, and only that is might they image the surface of your structures and uh, when you have an excessive force, okay? For the non-contact mode, uh, the tip is, doesn't really touch the sample, 
uh, is actually hover above the surface uh, and is measure the van der Waals forces in between. Uh, the problem is with this uh, non-contact mode, your resolution is always lowest. Uh, an experienced operator handling the AFM usually start with the non-contact mode. Okay, they, they don't want to jeopardize the tip of your cantilever. That's why they started with the uh, uh, lowest resolution first. Uh, although this is non-destructive, but your image will be a bit uh, oh, blurry and that's going to be as high resolution as the contact mode. The better uh, choice is to use the tapping mode. Okay? The, Tapping mode going to improve the resolution, okay, but uh, it's also have the uh, tendency to uh, destroy your tips. Okay? Tip is uh, also a bit expensive, okay? so you have to determine which uh, mode that is uh, going to be very useful in determining your image. Okay, this. Uh, the advantage and disadvantage of the contact mode. Take note that the uh, contact mode is going to give you high resolution, but it's also giving you a higher pressure. And in the end, uh, your topography is uh, going to obtain faster, but it also has the tendency to modify or destroy your surfaces. So it's uh, a no-no to the sample that is really soft. Or fragile. Uh, for the non-contact mode, uh, is is usually used for the soft material, uh, and it can extend it. Your uh, can deliver your your probe uh, but uh, as mentioned, is going to give you a very low resolution, uh, and you're going to have the uh, surface pollution there. And uh, in a certain condition, sometimes you have to use the help of uh, 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 UHV, ultra high vacuum, for better imaging. Okay. Uh, for the tapping mode, uh, it's usually work around a sample that is within 5 nanometer resolution. And there is uh, no friction forces. Uh, but yeah, when you use the tapping mode, it can endanger your tips and somehow destroy and damage the tips. Okay, and this tapping mode is actually slower because you need to, the time for the image to actually form. Okay, these are the difference between the contact mode and the tapping mode. So it's actually improved when you have a tapping mode uh, based on the uh, AFM image. How AFM can contribute? This is interesting. Uh, how can uh, AFM can contribute to your works? Uh, in this uh, recent publication, uh, I uh, our groups here uh, actually uh, give the uh, uh, determination of our uh, ionic liquid, okay, used in the polymer electron. Okay, and how the surface topography here look like. So we prove it based on the SAM and the AFM image. When you have an AFM image, you can uh, uh, optimize it based on the AFM 3D view. Okay, this is, is usually uh, come together with the uh, sample analysis. Okay, you can play around with the software there, uh, and you can generate the image based on the uh, uh, the uh, morphology that the micrograph image that uh, obtained. So uh, actually you can uh, further uh, analyze it to see the depth, the Z as I mentioned, the depth of the sample and the contour on how it's look like. Okay. So these are the advantage and disadvantage of AFM. It's only use a minimal sample preparation. Uh, uh, the important thing is that you can uh, have the ability to magnify within the three-dimensional surface profile, okay, we call this as a surface profile, meaning that you have the X, Y, and Z axis. Uh, and it has the possibility also to, to uh, be used to the uh, macromolecules in the uh, living organism. Uh, but 
uh, it's not really practical for those who having to view uh, large uh, surface uh, structures such as over than uh, 100 yeah okay and uh, it's not going to give you a, a good image if it's uh, the your surface here is done really smooth okay you have a large agglomeration uh, so the contour that is not going to be good so there is a possibility of image artifacts okay uh, so these are the comparison between the afm scm and tm uh, uh, sample preparation okay uh, almost none okay for afm uh, but you have to be very careful when you use the SEM, okay? Uh, it must be conductive, remember that. And how to make it conductive, you have to code it uh, using a sample quarter. For TEM, it must be really thin, okay? Uh, it must be able to disperse well in the uh, copper grid, or else we just see a clump, okay? Uh, uh, all the sample must be uh, conductive for SEM and TEM. But for AFM, you can use an insulating sample. Uh, okay. Uh, for the maximum size field that is able to be analyzed by AFM, it's around 100 micron. Uh, the SEM is around 1 millimeters. The TEM here is around 100 nanometers. And uh, this is important when, when you uh, talk about the measurement, uh, which exists on how you're going to represent your data whether it is a just a two-dimensional you can choose the sem but on the uh, it's on giving you the surface okay the surface analysis for the tem you can go into the inner structures you can see the uh, how it's built up of the, the atoms there the, the structural properties there uh, based on the two-dimensional also uh, these are both our micrograph but uh, when you have AFM, you can go up to three-dimensional. You, you, you know how the depth of your sample, how it's look like uh, as a topographical uh, analysis. Okay, this is uh, a comparison between SEM, TEM, and AFM. Take note that uh, this is how we represent the sample. The SEM going to give you uh, the surface analysis, the TM going to give you a further that this uh, sample is actually based on a few wire, okay, of fibers here. Yeah. And uh, the AFM image uh, based on the uh, colors is actually rep representing the depth profile, okay. So, which is uh, which is always depend on your uh, how to represent your data. All right, for the Take away, take home message that I would like to uh, emphasize here. Uh, take note that the characterization of nanomaterial is required in depth analysis, okay, using various analytical instruments. Uh, you already submit your sample to uh, various in instruments, okay, you already obtained the data, but the data wouldn't be very beneficial if you don't do any in depth analysis, okay. And uh, take note that when you have the analysis there, make sure the result obtained using these various instruments should be in good correlation to each other. It must be support to each other. You cannot uh, have a single characterization and say that uh, this is in contradict with the uh, TEM, the SEM. So things that uh, works around uh, in a similar principle must uh, support each other. Okay, that is the thing that you have uh, to consider. Okay, and based on the characterization you have done, take note that you can always propose something. This is the uh, postgraduate or researcher level. You propose something based on what you already obtained, meaning that you can propose a mechanism, the process changes, the crystal, how the crystal formation, and how the specific phenomena happen. That is the thing that uh, the uh, the thing that we call as a contributing factors. Puasa ni kan? Okay, so uh, that is the thing that is your, 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 your contribution to the uh, uh, research societies. Okay, so mean that you, you can able to propose something based on the uh, in-depth analysis there, based on the good correlation between the 
uh, uh, analytical studies. Okay, so with that, I would like to say all the very best. You are uh, the best of what you feel are. Okay, you are the expert there. Uh, but uh, you need to do some in-depth analysis and push further and just uh, do for your very best. And uh, in the end, uh, it's always up uh, to our God and just pray along the way. Okay? Uh, I wish you the very best on what you uh, study. In, right? With that, I would, say, I would like to say thank you. <clears throat> <clears throat> okay, thank you very much, Dr. John, for your presentation and the wishes for all the audience. Now we can begin with QA session. Please feel free to answer questions to our panel. So uh we have already a few questions have uh submit in the chat box. So on behalf of the audience, uh, I will address the question to our panel. Uh, first question is from Nora Biatul Adawiya. Does synthesis method affect the size or shape of our sample? If yes, what is the suitable or common synthesis method that can be produced uh, nanomaterials? Okay. Um... You want me to answer the question? Do you want? Sure, sure. Okay, that synthesis. <laughs> okay, that synthesis method affect the size. So, so actually, uh, nanometers that you mentioned here may be too broad. So, uh, different materials we give a different synthesis method. Okay. Uh, well, actually, the synthesis method does affect the size, shape characteristic of the sample okay uh, the actually the suitable or common synthesis method to uh, for to to get the certain nanomaterials to you need to you, you need to do it uh, try and error or you need to understand the process okay in order for you to adjust it in the lab okay for example like i want to synthesize zeolite highly pure zeolite like I mentioned before that, uh, like I mentioned in the slide, okay, I want to synthesize zeolite from the has ash as silica source, okay, but then from the SRD, I got this uh, impurities, which is uh, other zeolite than zeolite Y. So I need to do a lot of um, uh, synthesis method with different synthesis parameter. For example, we change the concentration of the raw material, we change the pH, we, we see the uh, aging time, for example, okay? Uh, if we want to prepare different um, materials, for example, like silica, erogen, nanoparticles, um, if we want to get a good um, aerogel, okay, so we need to adjust the pH, okay, during the sol gel processing technique. Okay, for the synthesis of civil nanoparticle, okay, civil nanoparticle, uh, civil nanoparticle from the uh, plant extract. So, uh, my student have done this optimization of the synthesis, par synthesis parameter. For example, like different concentration of the uh, plant extract, okay, different uh, ratio uh, between plant extract and also silver, uh, silver nitrate, uh, pH, different pH. Uh, different uh, time and also many things. So uh, to answer your question, what is the common synthesis method? There are no common synthesis method. Like a method. You need to understand your materials and then you need to do trial and error. Okay, uh, one more thing. You're talking about nanomaterial, right? Some nanomaterial, you need to have a, a template. Uh, like for example, surfactant. Uh, we, sometimes we call it as an organo template. If we, we if we did not use this organo template, we got this uh, material with high uh, particle size, micron size. But if you use organo template, okay, certain organ template with a suitable synthesis parameter, we will get materials with a nano size. 
So that is my answer lah on this. Okay, hope I can answer that uh, correctly. Okay, allow me to comment on that answer also uh, to add in some information. Okay, through what Dr. Nid said, uh, you have to optimize your way in achieving the target product of your intended samples. Okay, let's say you want this shape to be uh, changes in varieties. So you have to optimize based on the uh, few parameters. Uh, based on my experience in handling nanomaterial, uh, temperature, uh, pH, the concentration, uh, uh, and the mole composition of your sample is important. Uh, take note that nanomaterial usually follow what we call as the Oswald ripening uh, process. Okay, uh, this process, uh, whether you are going to uh, have a, a bigger size, uh, is always depend on the thermodynamic part. Okay, the, on the thermodynamic part, which is as uh, uh, everybody's uh, uh, talking about. It's always depend on the uh, important parameters, which is, uh, as mentioned, uh, the temperature will uh, giving you a swelling effect, okay, uh, a sintering effect, okay. It's going to give you a large particle. Uh, if you work with uh, certain precursors, the pH there, uh, let's say silica, uh, the acidic pH uh, going to give you a very fine particles, but the basic one going to give you uh, an uh, agglomeration of a particle. So, so that's uh, meaning that you have to optimize the, the way, okay? The, the, uh, uh, the, the, the procedure that you, you, you intend to use. And uh, what are the common uh, synthesis? Uh, well, synthesis, uh, there are a lot of uh, synthesis way in uh, generating nanoparticle. Uh, the, the, uh, a very famous one is sol gel, okay? meaning that you transform the solution into a gel, that is the most common. But there are a few also advanced materials such as laser ablation. Dr. Nick is well versed in biosynthesis okay, of nanoparticle. Uh, that are, uh, as, as uh, we, uh, as a researcher, uh, need to know uh, what are the things that you are, want to tackle on the problem statement of your. Uh, argument or your studies. So it's always depend on how you want to tackle the nanometer or the intended use or the application. All right. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Nick and Dr. John for the answers. So we move on to the next question <coughs> from Norliza. Why we must study about crystallinity of the material? Okay, so for the, <clears throat> maybe the Juan can also answer this question after this, okay. Uh, okay, it depends on the material also. There are materials that actually is in the crystal form. They are actually in the amorphous form. So for example, like, uh, like what I show you, zeolite or any other nanoparticles, they are in the crystal form. So some of the crystallinity is very important for the certain application. Okay, for example, like uh, if you want to use this material for the catalyst, as a catalyst, so we need to have a uh, material with high crystallinity. Okay, and one more thing in my study, okay, in my study, if you want to make sure that the sample does not give effect to the cells, human cell, okay, we need to have a low crystallinity because this crystal can also affect the cell. So it's like, a, because the, the, the higher crystallinity will give a, um, it's like a, what do you call it, a sharp edge, okay, of the crystal. So we need, so it's depend on the uh, application. Some of them uh, need to study the crystallinity. Some of them uh, just only uh, use SRD to determine the, use SRD to determine the, uh, structure of the uh, material. Okay, so uh, Dr. Juan, maybe you can can answer this question. You can add this on this. Okay. Uh, in the experience of the crystallinity, uh, as mentioned, you have to know the function of 
why you need to improve the crystallinity or the uh, amorphous structures of your material. Uh, basically, uh, when we increase the crystallinity, uh, there is uh, a possibility to increase your surface area, okay? so the surface interaction. There's always possibility on that, meaning that when the crystallinity is good, uh, the interaction of your intended sample and the application letter going to be good. Okay, there is always the possibilities. And when we talk about the amorphous material, uh, the randomized or the uh, low structures of your material, uh, okay, there is a crystallinity, there is an amorphous. Amorphous is when uh, there is no long arrangement of your sample. So it's usually occur in the silica, okay, silicates material. And uh, this is usually going to increase the density, okay? One, uh, crystallinity going to increase uh, your uh, surface area, okay, the surface interaction. One is going to increase the this density. So uh, in, in that sense, you have to know what are the intended uh, application of your usage. Usually in a photocatalyst, uh, if the crystallinity is good, uh, it's going to correlate later with the surface defects and the surface area, which is in the end, uh, you are going to have a good uh, photocatalytic activity. That is in, in my experience. <clears throat> okay, uh, the next question would be, it is possible to predict the answer of FTIR using other methods such as artificial neural network. Okay, uh, that wants to predict the answer of FTIR to meaning that the uh, to predict the what to predict the bonding is it the 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 result from the FTIR the bonding is it like that so because the um, uh, and then using artificial new, neural network. I'm not actually familiar with this, but what I do know is that this artificial neural network ni can be used to predict something, right? Uh, well, I, that is possible actually. That is possible, but we need to look at the uh, what we want to achieve. Uh, kalau, if you see here, predict the answer of FTIR. Um, what the bonding, C double bond O, uh, the the CO, the the, the functional group, uh, using other methods. Um, I'm not. Um, the question is here is uh, confusing. <laughs> okay, um, and I'm not familiar with the artificial neural network. Did you want? Do you know anything about the artificial uh, neural? Okay. I know that it is like. Um, <laughs> something that we use in the computer or in the mathematics and to right, predict right, something, right? right. Uh, true, true. Uh, I'm also not familiar with the artificial neural network, but in my uh, experience or in my comment here, uh, vibrational of our compound or the stretching mode of our compound uh, is actually uh, fixed uh, because it's uh, de determined based on the wave number and the energy uh, and it can be predicted based on the computer simulation. Uh, what we have done uh, to, in, our, in, my, in my studies, based on the, uh, in, in my group, in, based on the polymer engineering part, uh, where we predict the interaction, the mode of interaction of water and the precursors, uh, there is a certain type we know as a, is in silico uh, computational uh, approach, uh, which is, uh, the expert is uh, Dr. Fazira Eliana, the one that I have introduced you at the very beginning of my presentation. Uh, he, she will be uh, the best to comment on this. Uh, okay, but we can uh, simulate a model uh, based on the vibrational mode or the stretching mode or the interaction uh, using the computational uh, approach. Okay, we we already did it in, in, in the simulation, but when we talk about Artificial neural network is uh, out of my study. I'm not familiar with that. <clears throat> right. Okay. Uh, I hope uh, the answers from both of our speakers is uh, clear for no result. 
uh, regarding the uh, FTIR, uh, predict the answer of FTIR using other methods such as uh, artificial neural network. So uh, we continue with uh, the next question from uh, Rabiato Adawiya. Is it possible to use AFM for porous sample? Because I heard that the cantilever beam is so sensitive. And this one, Dr. Joanna. <laughs> okay. Yeah, the cantilever is sensitive and the tip is, uh, maybe the operator going to say that it's expensive. But uh, as uh, been explained in my uh, presentation, uh, in my speech earlier, the, uh, there is ways you can actually preserve your tips uh, using different modes. Uh, if your sample is actually a, a really uh, dense solid, uh, you actually can use the non-contact uh, mode, uh, which is you can always try to see how the uh, image forms. Okay, uh, I have uh, studied this uh, material, the porous material using the AFM, and actually you can make it provided provided that uh, your operator is a well trained one. Uh, if uh, the operator said that it is going to jeopardize the uh, cantilever tips, uh, maybe. Uh, they wouldn't proceed with that. It's always depend on uh, how you choose the mode. Okay, uh, actually you can done that. Uh, you can send try to send the sample to you UPM. Uh, the operator there is actually uh, well trained. <clears throat> okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. John. Uh, okay. Next question is from. Uh, pin Han Yap. Okay. Uh, how about nano droplets? Are uh, these measuring instruments such as uh, SAM or TAM able to measure substances in liquid form? Okay. Uh, from my experience, I don't know whether they come up with a new technology or not. But we, uh, but the SEM ATM is for the powder sample. Uh, it's for the uh, uh, solid solid sample. Uh, for example, like we synthesize uh, silicon particles, so. so my student will centrifuge to obtain the uh, powder form of silicon particle and submit for the SEM and also TM. So that's my uh, answer. Okay, mm, in my experience, this is a bit tricky. Yeah, usually uh, student or researchers tend to send sample in the powder form but there is ways if you really want to intend to submit a liquid a sample the the preparation during your uh, uh, displacement in the cooper grid is important uh, there is you can actually use a technique called as the uh, cryo uh, sample preparation. Okay, you need to immerse it in the liquid nitrogen, and then uh, you can uh, try to displace it in the uh, uh, Cooper grid. Okay, I already uh, use that method to uh, have uh, to get the micrograph of my uh, polymeric sample, which is in the gel and the liquid form. Uh, is it is uh, in terms of possible or not? It's possible, but the preparation method is uh, a bit tedious, and you have to have the, a good experience in handling liquid nitrogen. The techniques known as the cryo time uh, techniques uh, would be able to give a good uh, a possible micrograph image if if the sample is actually uh, nano droplets or in a liquid form. <laughs> What I want to add on that, so it's not directly in liquid form. Right? So I see MTM uh, used in the form of powder, okay? Uh, but actually for this uh, characterization techniques, uh, I see MTM, SID, FTR, and so on, AFM. So one of the things that you need to consider also is the preparation of the materials, pre uh, preparation of the sample before you do the characterization technique. So that's also 
really important lah that you need to know. Okay. Not true, just only uh, submit sample and then, okay, you want to get the results. Uh, uh, true, so it's not true, like true. that lah. Right? Yeah, yeah. You have to understand how to uh, prepare uh, or uh, how to prepare the sample before you hand in to the analysis. You're not going to be easily uh, used, directly measured. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Uh, next is from Mariam Sanusi. When determine, determining the particle size of a material, which method gives the best result? TEM or SEM? Or is it better to use particle size analyzer? Okay, if you ask me uh, whether TEM or CM or particle size analyzer, actually all of them. Okay, all of them because they are actually uh, complement with, uh, with uh, each other. However, it depends on the facility that you have. Okay, if you have TEM or ICM, I always ask students, okay, just use TEM. Okay, but if you have all of them, the facility, it's better to use all of them. Lah. Okay, uh, <clears throat> well, actually, for the nanomaterials, we're talking about nanomaterials. Uh, it's better to to use a TM lah, okay? To a TM because not just only give a particle size, but also like I said, it's a morphology, okay? Because for the particle size, I mean, they just give only the quantitative value, okay? Uh, but not for the morphology of the uh, sample. So TM lah is better for you to use a TM, okay? Do you want you want to add? Okay, when handling nanomaterial, uh, you cannot rely on one uh, analysis. Uh, it must, as the needs emphasize, as I already illustrated uh, earlier, uh, it must complement to each other. Your TEM, SEM must be in good support with the particle size analyzer. Of course, uh, provided there is a limitation of the availability of your instrument, just use what you have, <laughs> okay? Uh, but uh, if you are going to uh, support whether the uh, the morphology of the sample is really nanomaterial, and in the end you you're going to support it with the size, particle size, how how what is the quantification of the size? Uh, you you have to have both at least TEM and the uh, particle size analysis. In terms of the advanced uh, technology use, uh, TEM is more advanced than the SEM and the particle size analyzer. Yes, uh, Dr. Nick and uh, I agree that uh, you, you are not going to uh, achieve on the, the uh, morphology image, okay? but you can also analyze on in terms of the crystallinity uh, as well as the composition of the material. So if you have the limitation, uh, of the budgeting or the uh, what we call as the availability of your instrument, go for TEM direct. But as uh, we uh, of the emphasize, TEM is not a straightforward analysis. Uh, you have to be able to understand uh, what are the intended image you are going to have, and how to prepare the sample is important. Okay. Okay, uh, let's move on with the next question. May I know if there is a difference in the mechanism of structure directing agent and capping agent in the case of green synthesis? Is it the addition of capping agent is in hope that it won't grow into agglomerates without intention in shape controlling of nanoparticles? Okay, so this one they're uh, talking about structure directing agent and so capping agent. Uh, actually, um, in my biosynthesis, I did not do this. Okay, uh, because well, when we want to achieve this sustainable nanomaterial, okay, we try try to uh, avoid using organo template, and usually the organo template too is additional synthesis method and uh, that we need to we need to use 
some of the uh, surfactant and this surfactant uh, is harmful to us. So it's not sustainable. Lah. Okay, but if you want to get the exact shape, okay, and also size, you need to have the structure directing agent. However, in case of the biosynthesis, we are not doing that. Um, so it actually will affect the shape, lah, which means that the shape is not homogen, it's heterogen. And once we produce, uh, we, we use plant extract, we use the microalgae, uh, we, we got the, uh, the heterogen shape and the shape is uh, spherical. But if we, if we are using the structure directing agent, specific chemicals, maybe we can get the uh, specific structure, sp uh, specific shape. Like for example, triangle, cubic, ke, okay, something like that. So, uh, and one more thing is that, uh, the good thing about biosynthesis ni, because the plant extract tu is contain phytochemical compounds. Those contain various organic compounds inside there, uh, flavonoid, uh, apa nama tu, phenolic compounds and so on. So those actually uh, becoming a reducing agent and also is also uh, becoming a capping agent to prevent the agglomeration and also aggregation of the silver nanoparticle. Uh, so that is my answer lah in terms of this structure directing agent. Okay. All right. Uh, uh, you, you are almost correct on the, the use of the capping agent. Okay. It's actually used to control the size uh, to not, uh, it's, uh, to, to not uh, becoming a large size of the particles. And we want to, uh, control the agglomeration. Uh, usually it's known also as a stabilizing agent, uh, uh, such as uh, usually it's a polymer, PVP or something like that. Okay. Uh, for the structure directing agent, you usually use a surfactant type of uh, uh, structures, okay? uh, organic compound, which is uh, we try to avoid it in the green synthesis because uh, surfactant is not good in to, in to the, when released to the environment. Okay, uh, the, when, uh, the structure directing agent usually form uh, what we call as a micelle, okay, micelle structures, uh, whether it's a head to head interaction or tail to tail interaction, uh, the hydrophobic or the hydrophilic parts. Uh, this micelle is going to determine the uh, structures that we intended to use. Okay, uh, is it the uh, addition of the own crew? Yeah, yeah. Uh, as mentioned earlier, whether the addition of the stabilizing agent or the capping agent going to control the uh, size uh, is depend on the optimization process that you, you work in. Uh, if the composition won't work, uh, it's not going to tackle the overall system. Uh, when we talk about the uh, mold composition there, it's mass uh, sufficient enough, uh, not only to control the size, but it's also uh, must uh, stabilize the overall system, uh, meaning that uh, you have to do the optimization works. Okay, uh, and as mentioned, there are certain parameters that is actually going to uh, promote agglomeration: uh, pH, the uh, temperature. There are the two things that are going to uh, have significant effect in the size formation. So. Uh, you have to uh, to do some try and error, okay? Uh, optimization optimization of the mold composition and few parameters in order uh, to have what are the shape or the structures that you want um, using this uh, uh, surfactant use, okay? Such as uh, the ABR or anything uh, similar to that, uh, okay? We, uh, and you also have to uh, know uh, what is the appropriate amount use uh, so, uh, so that the capping agent will be uh, able to stabilize the overall system. Uh, that is always uh, in terms of the optimization works. <clears throat> Thanks. <clears throat> okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, so now we continue with <clears throat> question from Monica Jadam. Okay, she is very interested with uh, Dr. Nick research. So she is doing organic, inorganic, nanohybrid as well. 
uh, so she would like to ask, how do you conduct the release in mimicking gastric fluid? Are you using a PBS solution or maybe acetic? Okay, um, for the release, uh, here release of what? Release of drug, release of um, materials. So release of, um, usually we produce the nano hybrid need for the drug delivery system. So we want to know the release of the drug from the materials that we prepare. Okay, uh, and then we uh, assume that we want to eat this because this is drug. Okay, so we, we assume that we want to eat this, uh, what do you call this drug? Okay, or material. So the drug is inside the materials. So now we have a material. So we assume that we want to eat this, we want to consume it. So the first thing that will go to the gastric fluid. Actually, for the gastric fluid, you can see in the uh, British pharmacopoeia or American uh, pharmacopoeia. Pharmacopoeia too is a pharmaceutical book. Lah. It's like a standard for the pharmaceutical. They actually use it to uh, study the dissolution of the drugs, of the antibiotics of the drugs. Okay. So gastric fluid ni, it's not just only gastric fluid. You can see there is a simulated gastrointestinal fluid, uh, simulated saliva, uh, ILO, saliva fluid, uh, simulated body fluid. So for the simulated gastric fluid ni, it's contain uh, very acidic uh, uh, liquid solution. It's a hydrochloric acid. The pH is around one. And then some of them um, add pepsin. Uh, pepsin or trypsin, I forgot the enzyme, one, one of the enzyme. So it's actually mimicking the gastric fluid. So that is the simulated gastric fluid. So PBS solution is different. Okay, PBS solution is like, um, what is it just only buffer, okay, uh, or acetate. So that, that is a different, different thing with the simulated gastric fluid. However, okay, if you uh, some of the study also they use PBS and phosphate buffer solution to uh, to to know the release, okay, uh, and also acetate solution also can be used. Uh, it's depend on the drug, okay. It's depend on the release study that you want to the, the the release study that you want to perform, okay. So for for me, okay, for for my research. We want to use this zeolite as antacid. So antacid too is a uh, what do you call this? Uh, to increase if you got the apa nama tu? Uh, got the problem with the stomach. And uh, sometimes we say that sakit gastric. And sakit gastric. So gastric too, which means that the 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 pH of the stomach is very very low and below one. So we need to increase. Uh, we need to increase a little bit the pH and not not up to neutral, it's just only up to the two or three pH only. Okay, so that is a uh, for the simulated gastric fluid. Uh, so it's depend, it's de also depend on your uh, application. Lah, okay, uh, it's depend on the application. Sometimes organic, inorganic, nano hybrid, me also they use for the uh, what do you call this? The, external for the external application okay external application to for the wound healing so for the wound healing uh, the, the, the 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 not the best lah um, the um, pbs can be used okay to simulate that uh, apa nama tu external um, human condition okay so that is my my answer lah Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Nick. Uh, Monica, I hope uh, Dr. Nick's answer is useful for your research. Okay, so we move on to next question from Haspina. How many grams are needed for each sample to be tested? For example, XRD or FeeSent? Okay, uh... It's, it's depend on the instrument also. Okay, it's depend on your sample also. Sometimes SRD ini, we need to uh, to to get like one or two gram. 
Sometimes uh, uh, milligram. Okay, it depends on the sample. Okay, if I produce your light, so I can give more. But if you prepare a carbon nanotube, you just only get a small amount. They still can use uh, SRD, but um, they need to, to, to use a smaller sample holder. Same like FISEM actually, it's just only very few. Sometimes you just put a few amount of sample in the micro centrifuge tube. A micro centrifuge tube, centrifuge tube, chi. Okay, there is a micro centrifuge tube. So maybe like a 20 milligram only. Okay, so it's depend on the sample. If you can give more, you can give more. SRD is the uh, non destructive um, instrument. So you can get the sample back. Uh, and also it depends on the sample holder. Sometimes uh, the operator use the small sample holder. Sometimes it's very big. Okay, for the FISEM, it's just only very small amount. Okay, uh, very small amount, uh, milligram, not the gram lah, milligram only. Okay. Uh, for the sample that required for uh, to, to be sent for uh, instrumentation analysis, uh, yep, for FISEM and TEM, you require only around 10 to 20 milligram in your milligram scales. But for the XRD, it's depend on actually the brand of your sample uh, of your the instrument. Okay, uh, I have been the experience on using the uh, Rigaku and the Broker XRD. Okay, uh, Broker XRD required uh, a much more uh, large amount because the sample holder, yeah? the sample holder, yeah? uh, is actually. Uh, required you to be to fill in uh, a large surface okay so it's a bit uh, use, using up the uh, uh, your sample that but regaku uh, the japan brand that uh, you, you you only can uh, you, you you can provide the sample uh, around uh, one gram or less than uh, 0.5 gram it depend on uh, the sample holder that is uh, available for the instrument. Okay. Uh, again, the XRD is not a, a non-destructive analysis. You can always retrieve back the sample if you find it difficult to be prepared. Uh, so you can always ask back the operator there to have your sample uh, in return. Okay. After the analysis. <clears throat> Okay, uh, last question from our audience. I think there's not uh, there's not a question. Uh. So that's actually my um uh, uh, answer to the Monica. Okay. So I think uh, there is no more question from our audience. Okay, uh, looks like we have covered all of uh, our questions. Um, Dr. Nick and Dr. John, is there anything else you wanted to cover before a wrap up? Okay, um, it's for me, uh, like I said, uh, in my uh, in, in my uh, uh, talk, okay. Uh, and also I know that um, around 70% and 80% um, you are student, right? Uh, student PhD and also master. Okay, uh, so if you if you want, if you are doing research on the nanomaterials or materials, okay, um, and then come up with a different application, the most, uh, although you are not in the field of chemistry or material science, you need to understand the fundamental behind that. Uh, as for me, I'm a chemistry background, okay, uh, but I need to do uh, antibacterial testing. So we, I need to grow the uh, bacteria, I need to understand more about the microbiology, the accepted technique, many things. But I did not learn that during my degree. So what I did actually, I always um, read the fundamental books, okay, not the paper, okay, paper too is very high. You need to go to the 
uh, I always go to the library lah. Okay, because inside the library tu there is a book. Um, there is a fundamental book and buku. Uh, uh, if, if you want to learn about the uh, microbiology, there is a basic for microbiology book. Uh, so that's example lah. For example, like you are doing drug delivery system, but you are not in the pharmaceutical area. Okay, like Monica. Um, so what you need to do is that you need to to understand some field in the pharmaceutical. Uh, for example, in the pharmaceutical area, there is a British pharmacopoeia that you can follow. So that your uh, materials that you use is a uh, suitable for the application in the medical. And like I told you in the uh, last slide, design your experiment. Okay, that's also very important to design your experiment and use this characterization techniques to further um, what do you call this support uh, any result from your finding so i'm talking as a because i have experience uh, as a student i have experience uh, as a supervisor i have experience as a chairperson of the viva phd i have a, i have experience as a uh, as a minor for the viva phd so most of the student they just do not most lah okay not most okay there are some student who just do the characterization techniques because uh supervisor ask ask them to do or just follow from the previous uh books of uh, previous thesis from the previous research only without knowing the fundamental behind that so that is my uh what i call this uh final words lah to to all of the audience here yeah. Okay. And also thanks uh, to the UTHM, thanks to the chairperson Celine for this uh, uh, opportunity to share my uh, uh, my little knowledge on this uh, characterization of nanomaterials to all of the uh, audience today. Okay. Okay. Uh, as uh, take away message uh, from this session. Uh, the important thing is that uh, you have to know the why factors. As Dr. Nick mentioned, uh, based on his experience, experience and my uh, little experience, uh, students tend to only uh, follow what the supervisor intended to, to, to do uh, without knowing the, uh, uh, the fundamental aspect of your research. Uh, Design your experiment well and have the uh, uh, why factors then. Why you need to do this? Why you need to do that? And the characterization uh, going to help you a lot later in understanding uh, a new phenomenon that you are going to explore. Uh, if you have any difficulties in uh, justifying any uh, for uh, any phenomena, you can uh, try to contact us, okay, uh, Dr. Nick and Dr. Uh, on and my members in the green chemistry are most welcome to collaborate with you all, okay, uh, and uh, take note that in nanomaterial, although the scale is small, there is always a large possibility of new phenomena, and that is the wonderful thing about nanomaterial, okay. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, you are the best on what you are in the in the field of your expertise. Uh, but don't ever uh, have uh, the apa, difficulties on uh, to to say that uh, this is not possible. Okay, don't have the tendency to to say that uh, there is always uh, new possibilities. So have a good uh, spirit eh, in doing research and. All the best. Thank you to the secretary for inviting us to share our little knowledge on the characterization of nanomaterial. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you again for the fruitful presentation, Dr. Nick and Dr. John. Uh, it was a pleasure to have both of you with us. So uh, before we end the webinar, I would like to ask all the part participants kindly fill in the attendance form for your e-certificate. Uh, the attendance link is already given at the chat box. Okay, so now, uh, virtual webinar is not <coughs> complete with photo session. Therefore, I would like 
everyone to turn on their camera and give your big smile. Okay, Assalamualaikum everyone. So we will taking the pictures. We have three pages here. Um, yeah, there still people are not turning on their camera. Please do so. Okay, second page didn't turn on the camera yet. Okay, I may start now. Okay, for the first picture, give your big smile. Ready? One, two, three. Okay, another one. One, two, three. Okay, please give um, your best pose for our last capture. One, two, three. So this concludes the webinar. Thank you all for attending. We hope this webinar enrich your knowledge regarding analytical techniques for nanomaterial characterization. We hope to see you again next time. Assalamualaikum, goodbye, and have a good day.